Welcome back. Thank you for joining us for episode 131 of Two Steps Forward, our daily Bible study. We are up to 1 Corinthians chapter 9, and we're in the second section of Paul talking about Christian freedom. So again, the flow of 1 Corinthians has been the first four chapters were really about spiritual pride, the divisions that pride causes, and how the Corinthians should be finding their identity, which is in the blood of Christ gifted to them. Uh, through the righteousness of Christ, you know. Um, however, they were very worldly and they were struggling with their identity formation. They were struggling. It showed itself in their sexual immorality. It showed itself in their lawsuits amongst uh, one another. Uh, it showed itself in their approaches to relationships, whether that be whether they be single or married. And now he's talking about how they treat one another in regards to their Christian freedom. And then the last chapter, he said, um, "Look, food that's sacrificed to idols." Mm -hmm. Um, he's going to talk about this again in 1 Corinthians 10, uh, too. He's going to circle back to this idea of food sacrifice to idols, which apparently was a big deal amongst them. Uh, it was a common thing in their culture. Sometimes the only only way people got to eat meat is if they went to pagan worship festivals. And they, so they so closely associated all meat with uh, pagan worship. And what he's suggesting then is that Okay, it doesn't matter if you eat this or not. What matters is what damage does it do to somebody else who might not understand Christian freedom the way that you do. If you abuse your Christian freedom uh, by hurting them uh, with this behavior, it confuses their consciences. And he's going to say, okay, here's an example from my own life of how I have uh, navigated a freedom that I have, but I chose to forfeit some of that freedom for your sakes. Okay? Mm -hmm. So, 1 Corinthians 9, make sure to read through your copy at home. Here is my personal paraphrase. Paul begins defending his freedoms and rights as an apostle. He understands that there are those in the congregation who are very critical of him. Remember at the beginning, we said there are some who follow Apollos, some who follow Peter, some who follow Paul. He suggests that a minister has the right to receive a legitimate wage for his work uh, and the right to get married as well, he mentions. Paul has forfeited some of those rights for the sake of the Corinthians, uh, but he nonetheless possesses those rights. It's perfectly reasonable, reasonable, and in fact, it's actually even built into the Old Testament law that the ministry worker would be provided for by the members of the body that he serves. Paul, again, has forfeited that right. He makes his living, we know, as a tent maker, not from the offerings of the Corinthians or anything like that. He did so because he didn't want any unfair accusations that he was doing this ministry purely for money, mm -hmm. which there apparently were some charlatans at the time who were doing exactly that. Paul says he preaches the gospel not for material gain, but because he's compelled to boast in the goodness of God. And while he considers himself free and he knows that he's free in Christ, Paul says that he's made himself, he, calls, he says, a slave to everyone to win as many as possible. He became a Jew to the Jews and a Greek to the Greeks. He was flexible in ministering to those who had the law of Moses and those who didn't have the law of Moses, so the Jews and the Gentiles. He was flexible in ministering to those with weak consciences as well as those with strong consciences. And he says he did this so that by all means, uh, by all possible means, I might save some. And in other words, it's about, it's about the gospel, it's not about me. And it's about the gospel, it's not about style. Uh, Paul then uses the analogy of a runner training for a big race. And he says uh, that runner disciplines his body through strict training, diet, exercise, sleep, priorities, pain. Uh, you know, everything is about the end goal, not about how, what you enjoy in the moment. And he does it all uh, for a prize that doesn't even last. And what should we do then in terms of self-discipline regarding a prize that is what he calls an eternal prize? Paul ministers and lives his Christian life like it's the most important thing in the world because he knows that ultimately it is. Mm -hmm. That's the summary for 1 Corinthians 9. Mm -hmm. Any immediate reactions to that? No, I heard someone say the other day, if you have a body, you are an athlete. And I was like, that's, <laughs> that's maybe like a gross over-exaggeration, I don't know. <laughs> If you have a body, you are an athlete. Um, I I think it could be improved upon, that statement. I think I, I would agree to the extent that I would say if you have a body, you are 
supposed to steward that body uh-huh. like you have a responsibility mm-hmm. I don't, that where you define athlete I don't know exactly mm-hmm. where that fits in there but we all so I guess what I would say is you can't dismiss I'm not an athlete and then never take care of your body mm-hmm. and just say like well yeah. athletes do that do you think I'm an athlete I think you do things with your body <laughs> <laughs> which sounds that's weirder than I intended it to uh, no I, I know you I know you're you're one that didn't like natively love sports growing up or anything yeah. like that. I awkwardly played basketball for six years. But in the in, last year I played, I scored two points for, for the opposite team. team. I I don't know. You it's have confusing a career, how you switch in the middle. Your career, if you had a sports card on the back, it would have <laughs> negative two points <laughs> as your career totals. Yeah. Um, so, so yes, I know that. But, but I also, in recent years, you've been doing a lot more. I was talking to a patient the other day, um, a little girl, and she played the clarinet, and I said, oh, I used to play the clarinet, and she said, yeah, I'm first chair, and I was like, well, I was terrible because I never practiced. Like, I didn't want to, so my mom would tell me, when you get home from school, you need to play the clarinet for this many minutes, and you need to practice your basketball for this many minutes, but I never wanted to. Yeah, why Like, not? I just, <sighs> probably because I was a little lazy and a little disinterested, and, like, I wasn't really interested in those things. I just did them because... That's what everyone else did, so I thought I was supposed to do those things. Um, Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, um, we're going to talk about self-discipline today a little bit, Mm -hmm. and Paul's going to use the analogy of an athlete and the uh, that idea of okay. I mean, I'm sure what he's saying resonates with athletes, but self-discipline. Okay, even if you're playing clarinet, Mm -hmm. like it's the concept, whether it's sports or music or Mm -hmm. whatever. Uh, it requires you to sacrifice one thing here for the sake of greater benefit and glory yeah. here. Yeah. Interestingly, though, I would spend all the time in the world on my schoolwork. And I think I thought it's because that would be get me something in the end versus, like, I'm not going to be a professional basketball player. I'm not going to be in any orchestra. Mm-hmm. So, like, why would I pour my time and energy into these things that aren't going to benefit me? Right. Which yeah. maybe is a very, like, myopic way to think about them like they can give you pleasure or like a hobby like plants aren't going to get me anywhere but i enjoy growing plants right yeah yeah no it's it's interesting it it always requires for further pursuit in one area requires some sacrifice in another Mm -hmm. area and um yeah so the idea then for from a christian standpoint is what is the thing that is our passion Mm -hmm. that we value the most and everything else in life should theoretically be set aside or sacrificed or be willing to be sacrificed Mm -hmm. for the sake of that in the long run um so here's our devotional thoughts for today number one uh payment for gospel ministry is what we'll call it and so i also i mentioned this a little bit already chapter nine seems like a new topic it's not it's between obviously chapters 8 and chapter 10 but in both of those chapters Paul is going to talk about Christian freedom and specifically in their context food, meat that's sacrificed to idols mm-hmm. are we allowed to eat it or not are we, allow- are we not allowed to eat it and Paul's been talking about how they should navigate Christian freedom and not abuse Christian freedom and now what he's doing in chapter 9 is he's saying here's an example from my own life mm-hmm. I could I'm free to receive a wage from you guys uh, Paul, we know he's accepted gifts from other churches. Mm-hmm. Philippians 4 uh, talks about that. There's a couple other spots where he gathers gifts, where he takes it to Jerusalem or whatever. So he, he has received wages and gifts from others. Mm-hmm. He specifically chose not to take one from the Corinthians. Kind of throws Peter under the bus, doesn't he? Like Peter brings his wife along and then he, you pay both of them. I, I don't, he doesn't <laughs> quite say that. He does say that I was free to take a wife. And we do know that some of the apostles were married. But uh, he says they're free to do that. Mm-hmm. But in my circumstance, see, Peter didn't minister in Corinth, really. No. Uh, so he had a bigger job. He didn't, well, I wouldn't say that. But he, uh, Paul is essentially is saying, okay, in this specific context, you guys have this other group of people, which someday when we get to 2 Corinthians, we'll talk about this group a little bit more. But Paul certainly has his detractors, mm-hmm. and he knows that there's charlatans in the city. And by charlatan, I know that's kind of an old-timey word, but it's um, you know uh, people who market themselves as really spiritually mature religious leaders, but they're only doing it to make a buck and mm-hmm. only doing it to try to control the society. And Paul knows there's people like that and the Corinthians are susceptible to that. 
And he says, okay, I'm gonna, how can I prove to you that I'm not doing this to make myself famous and I'm not trying to mm-hmm. take your money? He said, I'm, I'm gonna do it for completely free of charge. Mm-hmm. And so he says, I was free to take a wage from you. In the Old Testament, it's prescribed in the law that the Israelites had to bring offerings, not just as a first fruit offering to God, but the uh, Levites and the priests got paid through that, those gifts. He says, I'm free to do that, but I'm not going to do that. I'm mm-hmm. forfeiting that right so that you guys know I'm, I'm trying to glorify God. I'm trying to serve you. This isn't about me. Mm-hmm. And so um, is, is it acceptable for payment for ministry and stuff like that? Yes, absolutely it is. And it's encouraged in other places. And Paul uh, makes that argument. Um, so it's, he's not saying that there should never be, you should never have ministers or anything like that mm-hmm. uh, or that they shouldn't be paid. Um, that's clearly not the case. What he's saying in this context, he chose to forfeit that freedom because he thought it would be an obstacle to them perceiving him as truly um, caring, Mm -hmm. caring about them. Uh, Devotional thought number two, everything to everyone. Um, Paul says, I'm a Jew to the Jews and I'm a Greek to the Greeks. Um, I behave like strong conscience, to the people who have strong consciences and I behave like somebody who has a weak conscience with the weak conscience believers. Um, And he says, my goal is to save somebody in the process. And um, Paul's not the only one that does this. Jesus does it, uh, his methodology changes a little bit. So if you look in John chapter three and four, in John chapter three, Jesus interacts with a Jewish leader named Nicodemus. Mm -hmm. And um, he specifically says, the, the, the. purpose of his message or the point of his message is spiritual rebirth with Nicodemus. He was short, right? No. You're thinking of Zacchaeus. Okay. He fell out of a tree. You have this thing where you confuse everybody with Zacchaeus. <laughs> he fell out of a tree. There's like 12 different characters that? that you confuse with Zacchaeus. <laughs> I'll let you know when we get to Zacchaeus. <laughs> his name will be Zacchaeus. <laughs> but that Nicodemus Nic- buried Jesus, got him out of the tomb. Yep. Nicodemus and Joseph of Arimathea. See, I know things. Yeah. Correct. He is one of the Sanhedrin, one of the Jewish leaders. He comes to Jesus in the middle of the night. And Jesus, he's a religious leader, and Jesus talks to him about spiritual rebirth. Oh, mm-hmm. The next chapter in John chapter 4 is the Samaritan woman at the well, and Jesus talks to her about living water. So it's like a very different conversation. Mm-hmm. Um, with Nicodemus, he's essentially talking about how you must repent. Uh, with the Samaritan woman, he's talking about like perceived needs. She thinks all she needs is some water. And he says, I've got, so he touches on perceived needs with her. It's a different methodology. It's the same gospel. It's the same Jesus. It's a different Mm -hmm. approach and a different conversation. Paul does the exact same thing. Mm -hmm. Why should I believe that one size fits all? The gospel is the only thing that fits all. Mm -hmm. But the strategy and the conversation, the language, the communication, the culture, that all changes. And so I I navigate this world, Mm -hmm. the Greek world this way, and I navigate the Jewish world this way. And that's just good ministry because ministry is essentially taking God's word and connecting it with God's people. Mm -hmm. Those are the two things. Um, I remember actually, there was some time when I was at the seminary and the president there at the time I had a conversation with him and um, I was like, I'm not really sure I want to be a pastor. Like, Mm -hmm. I love Jesus and I'm fascinated by human beings and I, but I just don't know like the idea of being a pastor. I don't know that that appeals to me. And he said, James, you know, I think being a pastor is like two things, Mm -hmm. Uh, loving God's word and loving God's people. Like if you can do those two things, that's ministry, connecting those two things. That's ministry. Yes, right. Yeah, I don't know if that's being a pastor. That's all you need to be a pastor. Well, I don't know that You can do ministry in any job. Correct. Mm -hmm. Correct. I guess I would make the distinction that pastoring is one kind of full-time public way to to do that. You should do ministry. Uh, Every Christian should, but like public ministry is like a pastoral calling. And um, that, you know, that made a lot of sense to me. if you compromise what the Bible says, so there's two pieces to that, right? It's God's word and God's people. If you compromise what the Bible says, the gospel says, that's heresy. Mm-hmm. That's obviously wrong. However, if you approach the ministerial aspect with like a one size fits all, mm-hmm. like this is the way every human should take this, receive this, talk about this, that's dehumanizing. Mm-hmm. And that's the thing, at least where I kind of grew up, I don't think that was always understood, that humans are different from human to human. They have one basic need, Mm -hmm. uh, a savior from their sins, 
but they're different people with different communication styles and different personalities and all that. So mm-hmm. it's the, Paul, if you're going to be a missionary in any way, whatever that means, public or just in your day-to-day life, you have to figure out how to say you first and be a Jew to the Jews and a Greek to the Greeks. Mm-hmm. Any thoughts on that? No. Okay. Devotional thought number three then. Um, Christian self-discipline. Uh, remember, Greece is where the Olympics began. The I think the Greeks always fancied themselves as like the athletes of mm-hmm. the world, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, and so Paul uses with them, he uses a decent amount of like athletic illustrations. Mm-hmm. I'm sure he did in his day-to-day ministry as well. And so what he's talking about here is somebody who's essentially training for a, you know, mm-hmm. decathlon. And he's like, if they have their eye focused on the goal of an, an, an end line, a goal line, and they use diet and exercise. And uh, in other words, they cut off, they don't just eat whatever they want. They don't just do whatever they want. They train their bodies, and he says, he literally says they beat their bodies in such a way to prepare themselves to cross that finish line. And what he's using there is the spiritual analogy. When Again, when it comes to freedoms, there's lots of things in life that I could do, mm-hmm. right? We have lots of freedoms. However, what is the main goal? The, the aim for the Christian life is the crossing the finish line of entering into God's home in heaven. Mm-hmm. Now, obviously, we know that's not something we earn. That's something that Christ has given to us. But is it possible to abuse Christian freedoms in such a way that it's negative to our faith or negative to other people's faith or could potentially deter us from ever crossing that line? Mm-hmm. Yes. And so what he says is keep your eye on the prize. Stay focused on that and discipline yourself in your life in such a way Uh, that you are as much God's agent and as much of benefit to other human beings for crossing that finish line as possible. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of people struggle with how much, like what they are supposed to do for God. Um, So I'm reading this book and it's talking about how there are so, there's so much information out there on like self-fulfillment and self-discovery and like figuring out who you are. And she's making the point that, yes, you do need to do that for a very small portion of your life or time. And then you just need to, like, do something. Like, Mm -hmm. move in a way God is telling you to move. There was a John Piper quote. He said, this is how you find your purpose. You know scripture, you know yourself, and you know the need around you. So it was just kind of like... You just open your eyes up to what God puts in front of you. And if you put something in front of you, then you just do it. Yeah. You just fulfill the needs you see. And that's how he uses you. So for for pe- lots of people, like that might look very different. Like it might be like adopting a kid. Or it might be, you know, serving people with mental health issues. Because that's something pertinent to you. Or like I just think we don't need to spend so much time being like oh what does god want me like what does god want me to do i don't know the the um sermon you preached on vocation no is that yeah recently yeah we talked about meaningful work meaningful work yeah i thought was so good because it really hammers home the point like you don't have to be a missionary and one thing she says in this book and i think it's just like a mindset of like 90s christianity because i know i thought the same thing like Ugh, the, like the number one Christians are like the missionaries who leave everything and go to do that work. And then like number two are like called yep. public ministers. Sure. And then yep. everybody else is worse than that. Like yep. they're more selfish. They're more self-indulgent. They're not, they're more, they are more concerned with being comfortable. They don't love God or are as concerned with what God wants for their lives. And right. that's just not true. Yeah. That's not God's calling on everybody. Mm-hmm. Right. Vocation literally means... It, it it comes from the Latin word vocara, mm-hmm. or vocara, which means to call. So vocation means your calling. And the reason why that's a Christian word uh, is because pe- people, it's become a huge topic because it, I think you mentioned in the 90s, I felt like that was the mindset. I think you're exactly right. I think that's how people like mm-hmm. tiered it. And what it's vocation says is, no, the person who is on the bottom of that man-made tier Mm -hmm. is just as much called by God. They're just called into something different. They're called to glorify God by, I always sort of say, you know, rearranging the raw material around you in such a way that it glorifies God by serving humanity. So Mm -hmm. what am I doing to serve 
humanity in my day-to-day life in my day-to-day whatever mm-hmm. whether that's again healthcare, law school whatever yeah um I think you can do anything for money or you can do that exact same thing for a different purpose. Right. To help people or to serve people or... Right. Like you could be a pastor for money. That, that's what he's saying, right? You yeah. Could. Or f- just for prestige. Like the idea that I want to be in charge and I want to control people and mm-hmm. I want to be the head of something. Mm-hmm. Like, I mean, do is there are there any pastors who might struggle with that like that's their identity Mm -hmm. is not just that like i'm a child of god by grace and i'd be perfectly fine with myself if i wasn't the pastor but i like being in charge of a lot of i'm not saying there's you know every Mm -hmm. pastor out there is this um but i'm saying that that potential exists like that pride and that selfishness totally can exist in public ministry just as much as it can in um you know other other callings Mm -hmm. So, yeah, am I doing what I'm doing for the glory of God and the benefit of others, or am I doing this primarily for myself and selfishness creeps in everywhere? Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, what do you, anything, other thoughts on, like, the again, the self-discipline and not being mastered by anything that feeds into the whole, what we've talked about with Christian freedom in the past couple of days? Um, well, my Bible says... Self-discipline is a long, steady course in learning attitudes that do not come naturally and channeling natural appetites towards God purpose, God's purposes. And then it says, where are your weak points? You should pray with a friend for God's help to redirect your weakness into strength. So in my Bible reading group the other day, um, it, we are in Titus, and it said, the verse was, To the pure, all things are pure, but to those who are corrupted and do not believe, nothing is pure. In fact, both their minds and their consciences are corrupted. And someone posed the question, she said, Does anyone really understand what this verse means? Because I know the Bible tells me I am pure now that I am redeemed, but I don't feel like everything is pure to me. It's a minute-by-minute struggle in my head to not have lustful thoughts and keep my mind pure. When it says all things are pure, does that mean it's because I've already been forgiven. Um, And I think that just goes, that's exactly what he's saying here is, I think it's, I think they're saying in Titus that yes, you are pure because you have a new man inside of you. Like the Holy Spirit is what allows you to even want to fight that fight. Mm -hmm. Because if you weren't a believer, why would you? Like the society tells you like those thoughts are natural or even it's good to have thoughts because then you're not having actions. Right. I, the thing that that individual mentioned that really sh- stuck out at me is not just the word feeling, because I don't want to mm-hmm. harp on that word, but uh, she mentioned something about, you know, I don't always, I feel this way or I don't feel this way. I think the, is it, there's a difference between being feeling pure mm-hmm. and um, being declared pure mm-hmm. in the same way that there is a difference between feeling forgiven and being declared forgiven. Mm-hmm. So I am justified in the Bible literally means to declare not guilty. It doesn't mean that you never feel guilty. Mm-hmm. And uh, in fact, the feelings of guiltiness are, are often what drive us to repentance. Mm-hmm. Um, so like the feelings can be good, but they're often there's an inconsistency and incongruity between how I perceive myself and how God perceives me through the lens of Jesus cross. And the goal, what Paul is talking about here, and the goal in that sanctification process is to say, okay, here's how God sees me. How do I come more in line with being what God already sees me as, what Mm -hmm. he's already declared me as through Christ? I am not there yet. Like, so anybody who says, yes, I'm sinless and I'm totally pure right now is, um, I mean, James says, if we think we are without sin, we're, um, you know, we're, we're deceiving ourselves. So like, I totally, yes, I do struggle with sin. Yes, I do struggle with being impure. Mm-hmm. God sees me as pure. So the more I, um, the more I rejoice, the more I repra- praise him for how he sees me versus how I see me, the more I actually become the person that he sees. Mm-hmm. So self-discipline is a long steady course in learning attitudes that do not come naturally and channeling natural appetites towards God's purposes. Where are your weak points? <laughs> We're really gonna put me out there, huh? Um, yeah, I do. I have lots of weak points. Um, the performance-based identity, 
we've talked about. Um, so that's part of it. Somebody actually, I just got an uh, email today from somebody uh, who I appreciate uh, you following along, studying with us and all that stuff. And they encouraged me to check out this other resource because I, you know, I'm very open with my um, depression struggle and all that stuff. Mm-hmm. And um, they said something along the lines of, I, I only skimmed through it this morning, but something along the lines of like, you seem like you don't, um, haven't felt Christ's love yet. Like, mm-hmm. not, not that you're not a Christian, mm-hmm. but that you haven't fully experienced Christ's love yet. And uh, they were saying they can relate to that, but that this resource helped them mm-hmm. with that. And um, I think that's, you know, for me is certainly a weak point. I don't know to what degree I can control it, um, but the idea of being optimistic, positive, like I know ultimately, I, like I sometimes just want to get across that finish line faster, mm-hmm. you know, like, so I think for a weak moment for me is actually rejoicing in the blessings that God gives me on a daily basis and being grateful for them and thankful for mm-hmm. them and, and that mm-hmm. sort of thing. Great. So, do you have anything specific that you thought, yeah, here's um, how, I, how I need to work on self-discipline? Well, my natural appetite is um, I don't want to do things. So, like, I just want to watch Netflix in the limited free time I have. Like, I don't want to do any kind of, like, service work or really anything. I'm like, I'm so exhausted. I'm so busy all the time with my actual work that I don't want to do anything additional. Even things like spend time with fellow Christians, which I know is important. I just don't want to. Mm -hmm. I just want to sit. It just becomes like self-preservation when you already feel stressed. Yeah, yes. But I know like when people actually ask me specifically to do things and I end up doing them, I know that that is God asking me to do, or giving me an opportunity, I should say, to do those things that glorify him. And I end up feeling good about those things. And not feeling like they drain me more. Right. They were, in some ways, kind of energizing as opposed to draining. I think yes. That, I mean, just to make ourselves aware that sometimes Satan can cause us to look at even fellow Christians as only taking from us, taking from us, as yeah. opposed to, like, maybe that's him trying to deter us from the Christian community that God says actually fuels us. Yes. So, so I didn't want to do the... In fact, when we started the women's mentoring program, I didn't want to do it only because I thought it was too time consuming. Someone asked me to do it, I said no. And then someone kind of specifically was presented to me as a mentee. And I was like, okay, I feel like this is God asking me to do this. And it, it is a big, it's a lot of, there's a lot of things to do in it, but I, it's been so good. It's mm-hmm. just been so beneficial to I think both of us and I feel good about it and I feel like God is using me in good ways. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Good. Well, with that, you want to close this with a prayer? Sure. we have loosening up for <laughs> a vibrant prayer. Uh, dear Heavenly Father, thank you for the uh, gift of the Holy Spirit inside us that actually allows us to even want to uh, glorify you. So if If he wasn't there, I don't even know that I would want to try to have any self-discipline or overcome any of my, like, natural appetites or uh, sinful, sinful desires. I think a lot of us struggle with, like, comfort, being comfortable, like, my time is my own, my money should be my own, the things that bring me comfort and pleasure and joy. So please break us of those attitudes and just remind us daily that everything we have is a gift from you. Nothing is our own. And like James was saying, we rejoice in the blessings you have given us and we try to use those uh, wisely and uh, in- both enjoy and steward those. Um, but we also look for ways that we can share those blessings with other people. So please continue to place those opportunities in front of us. And um, I pray that we would have people in our lives who would present those, like, be courageous enough to present those opportunities uh, to us, regardless of how busy we seem or, uh, like, we don't have the specific gifts for that we seem, if that makes sense. Um, So please be with us as we go into the week and help us to have good, positive attitudes and to show your love to the people we encounter. Amen. Amen. Thanks for studying with us. We will see you tomorrow for 1 Corinthians chapter 10.